OK, uh, so we talk about uh, uh, how to use this next generation sequencing help us to discover which gene is responsible to which disease or things like that. All right. So this is really in the research market when we want to figure out what is uh, causing the disease. And uh, the second direction of next generation sequencing, especially DNA sequencing, is uh, for the personal genome sequencing. And this will have much bigger clinical applications or implications in the, in the near future. I'm talking about the future is not uh, like uh, 50 years from now. It's five years or three years from now. When the human genome costs uh, you maybe 500 bucks for each genome, and at that time, these things can really be used into clinical applications. Okay? And uh, at that time, the sequencing cost really dropped. And uh, when the sequencing doesn't cost any money, and the analysis will become the most important part. So you guys are in good shape. That's what we hope. So two examples I want to introduce here. And uh, the first one is, uh, uh, I think this is uh, from Russ Altman's group, uh, is uh, published in Lesson last year. It's a clinical assessment of 40-year-old men who are presented with a family history of uh, a chronic artery disease and a sudden death. So it's a family of, of that. So this individual is perfectly healthy. Okay, he just have some family history of uh, having some trouble. And uh, how we can use the whole genome sequencing information help us uh, in terms of in the clinics. And the second one is a much uh, more moving story. It's a story of Nick uh, Walker. This is a kid and. Uh, and this is represent the leading edge of wave moving across the genetic medicine. So we'll get into that. Okay, let's go to the first one. All right, and we don't have one human genome. We have six billion human genome, right? Because this is the number of people we have on this planet. And each individual one really have this own unique genome. That's a huge market to do it. And the cost per megabase of DNA sequencing really dramatically goes down. And uh, you can see this is uh, the per megabase of DNA sequencing. And 10 years ago, it cost you anywhere from $7,000 to $10,000 to sequence one megabase of DNA. As for today, one megabase of DNA, the cost of sequencing is 17 cents. Okay. And this is uh, most of them are actually administrative costs, and the real reagent cost is a four cents to sequence a one megabase of DNA. Okay, and this is a Moore's law, so we can see how much information we are accumulating during the years. The same shape, the cost per genome also dropped dramatically. Okay, and this was ten years ago, but today. It goes to, so this is a March 2011. This is a, by the way, this is a based on the National Institute of Health, their, their, their statistics. And uh, in March 2011, it's about $10,000 or over that per genome. Today, it's about $8,000, so a couple months later. And uh, so you can see that uh, this trend that goes, it's really not too much longer than we can get to 1,000 genome sequencing and the e I mean $1,000 human genome and even cheaper than that, okay? And uh, so that really makes the personal genome more important and how we can use personal genome to help us into the clinical practice. That's very important. And the, the example here shows uh, in the last in the publication is a 40-year-old man he has a family history of uh, chronic artery disease and sudden death. And this uh, individual actually appears well. And uh, he doesn't, his medical history was uh, not clinically significant, it's perfect. And uh, the patient exercised regularly with, uh, without symptom and taking no prescribed medications. And the clinical characteristics were within the normal rates. So if you read the slides, and this is the clinical reports, okay, that's the future for really the, 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 the clinical practice, so the age, the height, and all those kind of blood pressure and all those things, okay? And uh, the family history, so you can see that this is uh, uh, what 
the individual we are doing the sequencing and their parents or siblings and all those things is so this individual had a sudden death and this uh, these individuals had certain type of uh, cardiovascular disease uh, in the family history but this particular individual we are sequencing appeared not problematic and uh, the, the experiment they did was they used uh, helicose technology. We know that helicose, unfortunately, they were delisted in the market. So, but uh, but uh, other technologies can do the same job. So it, they had uh, 148 giga of raw sequence and uh, 33 base rates and detected 2.6 million SNPs and 752 copy number variations in this individual comparing to the so we see this type of statistics a lot, but what that really means, how that can help us, right? And uh, they did some certain level of validations, including the all variants discussed with parents were validated using the Sanger sequencing. So basically, this is really for the ethical part before the doctor say, you are disposed to, to cardiovascular disease, and uh, this is the variants supported. They have to make sure about that. So they did uh, some Sanger sequencing to confirm those. And the copy number variation costs were validated using PCR. So they did quite an extensive validation on that. And disease risk analysis. And analysis really focused on four areas. And uh, the first one is uh, they want to look for the variants associated with genes for medallion disease. OK? And those are kind of lower hanging fruit to see whether it's, it's, it's a problematic. And they also want to look for the novel mutations and also the variants known to modulate response to pharmacotherapy. Okay, we will see the application for that. And they also want to see the single nucleotide polymorphism previously associated with complex disease, so reported by other research uh, stories. The database that they use, so this part is, uh, is the, the general areas that they are interested in. But to get this in, in information, you do need a knowledge base. And this is another important component of this personalized medicine. It's a knowledge base. The database required here is a disease-specific database, OK, a mutation database. And there are it's a, uh, there's a, there's a many databases uh, if you, you look at the literatures. And uh, an important one, which is the human genome mutation database. And, uh, I think uh, Matt Moore, one of the guys working in Sean's group, was from that, uh, uh, that, that database, that, that institution. And, uh, and also the OMIM information. So those are the knowledge base that is required, uh, although, not necessary, uh, although it's not sufficient, but it's necessary to really make any clinical recommendations. And this is very, I, I believe they also use the PharmacoGB uh, information there, which. Ross Altman is the PI of, right? And, uh, and they also made, uh, for the novel mutations and those things, they did a, a prediction based on the allele frequency, conservation, and pre, pre dominant uh, dis disruptions. And, uh, and this figure, I, I know you don't see it, and I don't see it either, but the point is uh, you got individual patient variants, and there's uh, many different tools that you can use to help you to prioritize which individual one is important. It's potentially important. It's not necessary, right? And, uh, and they found that rare and novel variants are predisposed to disease. Search for evidence of rare and novel variants that would predispose for patients and his family to the disease. And they found that for the cardiovascular disease, they discovered rare variants in three genes that are clinically associated with sudden cardiac death, OK? Keep in mind that they had a, a sibling that are that very young and uh, in the early stage, sudden death. So these three genes are potential problematic. And this is not only a diagnosis for himself, but also some of his family members that had shared the same gene. And uh, revealed three novel and potential damaging variants in two related genes that were previously associated with development uh, uh, hemochromatosis, okay, but no family history were reported, and uh, the heart, I, I guess this is some, some type of heart disease, and they also did uh, echo, uh, echo uh, cardiogram results and shows uh, uh, their, their functions are, are this particular patient, the, the, it, it looks pretty good. 
and justification for continued uh, um, uh, surveillance and testing with serum Aaron studies with support with patients. So, so, the, so in a short, that they found some problematic genes that this person didn't show the phenotype yet, but they want him to be careful and continue to monitor uh, in the in the future. Uh, so that's a, that's one of the the help they can gain. Okay, this is a very important graph. I think it's very informative. And on the left right side of the list, this is for different d disease or, or or health conditions like obesity, obesity, and uh, and uh, uh, coronary uh, <coughs> coronary uh, artery disease and type two diabetes and uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, what is showing here is uh, you can see there's a dot here. Okay, each dot represent the risk before they did a personal genome sequencing. So the clinical reported risk for that particular disease. This person, are, so it's a pre-test probability. And this is, X here is really the probability. And this person has 28% to be obese or in the, in the later lab or things like that, all right? And uh, the line here really tells you the range of a probability that after you kick in this personal genome information. So, and if the arrow goes to this direction, that means the probability increased, and otherwise it is decreased. So the point here is uh, clinical, personal genome information is important. Clinical information is important too. So we have to combine this both to really have informative clinical implication on the individual and eventually using into the uh, uh, diagnosis or, or, or uh, treatment. And uh, uh, one thing that I, I pull out one of it, and uh, so this is a, a myocardial infarction, and uh, th it, this person has a seven SNPs that are uh, reported to potentially have problem with uh, this particular disease. And it also tells you uh, the contribution of each variation to contribute to the risk of this disease. So I think this is a type of a clinical report, yeah, the clinical report that can be presented to the patients eventually in the, in the future in the clinical practice, yes? So I don't know the, how the detail how they calculate on the risk. I don't know either. I think the, uh, the risk for the genome is a lifetime risk from birth. Right. Exactly, that's exactly true. So, so, and that's why that they have to combine this, uh, this uh, clinical phenotype with the, the, the genomic risk and then to have a more informative evaluation. You can read it? <laughs> All right. You don't want to see mine, so I, I wouldn't say that's a beast because mine is higher than that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's overweight. It's a little bit overweight. Yeah, so it has the trend. That's why that uh, they, they, they were saying this is about uh, almost 30% of uh, obesity risk. And, but with the gene, it has a bad gene. So it can go to anywhere to 60% of the risk. Okay. So I, I think this is one of the examples that how the personal genome information can be used into the clinical application in the future, okay? And, uh, and uh, another information is uh, they also find out uh, 63 clinical relevant previously described the pharmacogenetic variants and the six novel ones, okay? And in, in terms of their ability of to uh, metabolize drugs, and uh, including this, uh, uh, this CYP gene, and which is, is, uh, can metabolize many different drugs, and uh, they evaluate whether this guy has a good gene to do the metabolism or, or not. And there's a two mutations also suggested that, that if a prescription of warfarin become necessary, loading could be individually tailored for these patients with lowered expected doses. This guy has a good gene to, to do that. And, uh, uh, the bad one. So the good response to statins, which is another drug. So uh, the point here is uh, this uh, genomic information, if the person are sick and needs to prescribe some drugs, 
and those genetic information can help us to predict which drug is, can be more effective in, the, in the, uh, the real treatment. So that is another application of uh, the personalized medicine. And uh, also, they, I, I don't know the algorithm they did that. I, can, I guess I can read a little bit further on the paper. And the point here is uh, the gene and the, and the environment interactions. This is a system, systems biology approach to look at things. So meaning that those diseases are not independent. If one person has heart disease, and it might get into more possible to have another disease. So you can see those arrows. If, if there's a type 2 diabetes that can contribute to this particular disease, which I cannot read here. But for some environmental factors, smoking can contribute to some, some things. So, so these are the information that are also um, uh, so the personal genome information of this individual is also integrated into uh, considering of the, the effect of uh, uh, the relationship between different diseases and, and, and their, their living habits. Is that OK? So I think this is a very important paper. And, uh, and uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, will be very widely used in the, in the later, uh, in, the, in the future, the clinical practice. The summary here is one of the, this is one of the first study of a comprehensive analysis of a human genome in a defined clinical context. The results pro provide proof of principle that uh, clinical meaningful information can be derived about disease risk and response to drugs in patients with whole genome sequencing data. So integrating the clinical information with personal genome information together, that is important. And the predisposition and risk of different disease is inter- dependent. Remember that last uh, uh, network. So if you have one disease, you're more likely to have another disease. And how likely it is to have, to have communication, also some, something written on your DNA as well. And the limitation uh, so far, uh, not about this particular study, but so far is a, a comprehensive database of a rare mutation is needed. So what do we need? OK, come back to this. What do we need to do this kind of thing? You need a clinical report. You need a genome sequencing. But you need a knowledge base. And so far, this knowledge base is something that we are missing. And, uh, and I think the scientific community is trying to make it better of this. It's a comprehensive database of rare mutations needed. So there are imperfections of all the human genome published, so meaning that sequencing information can somehow not uh, very accurate as well. And those are something that can be fixed in the later stage. Is what? I don't know that database. I'm sorry. <laughs> and the gene environment interactions are challenging to quantify and have been little studied. Gene environment interaction. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I think uh, we are certainly not, not to that perfection yet, and uh, not even close to that. And I think the, the point of this paper is not really based on the genomic information, trying to predict the risk of the disease, rather integrate uh, the clinical diagnosis information or health information and together with the genome information to correct what we have seen in the clinic right now. And, uh, and uh, Every problem that you were describing was still there, and, uh, and uh, I hope that we can find some way to fix that in the future. But anyways, this is uh, something that I think uh, will lead to be big uh, um, trend in the, in the next uh, 10 years also. OK, next story is more encouraging. It's uh, personal genome sequencing. It's a story of Nick Walker, the leading edge of a way moving across genetic medicine. And, uh, and this is a boy who was presented at 15 months of age with uh, uh, perineal whatever. OK, I, I cannot read those things. But the point is, 
it's pretty nasty disease. And here is more like a, the human language. This, this, this boy is severely underweight. When he ate, unusual holes would open between his intestine and skin and causing feces to leak into a large wound in his abdomen. It's really, really nasty. And had more than 100 trips to the operation rooms in two years, a surgeon removed his colon and remained helpless. So nobody can figure out what's wrong with this kid, and it's just wrong, OK? And, uh, and the age and the severity of the presentation suggests an underlying immune defect. However, despite the comprehensive clinical evaluation, we were unable to arrive at a definite diagnosis. So we don't know what's going on. And this is a part of uh, the latter. I mean, I really get this from the internet, okay, not any publications. And uh, the latter from this guy's doctor is, I think, is in University of Wisconsin Medical School. And I'm writing to ask if there is some way that we can get his genome sequence. Uh, there is a good chance that uh, Nico had a genetic defect. And it's likely to be a new disease. Furthermore, a diagnosis soon could save his life and uh, truly showcase a person as uh, genomic medicine. And uh, that's from his, uh, his uh, uh, doctor to his, uh, the doctor's department chair. All right. and, um, um, and also, there is uh, some other lines in, in the letter saying something, if uh, the only problem is the funding, and then we can try to get funds from other places or things like that. And eventually, you can see that they did a very inexpensive uh, study. It's axon sequencing on this particular kid. Identify, the goal is to identify calcium mutations through axon sequencing to provide the necessary additional information required for clinical management. Okay? And uh, what they did is they conducted axon sequencing. They identified 16,000 uh, variants. It's very normal. That's, uh, so in the axon sequencing, in you know, direct reaction sequencing, we identify about 30,000 variants. I guess they didn't have the funds to sequence very deep, so that's the ones that the, the numbers they identified. And the subsequential analysis identified a novel uh, homozygous, I think, missense mutation in the X-link uh, inhibitor of apoptosis gene and substitute tyrosine for the high conserved and functionally important uh, uh, system. And so on and so forth. So there's a clinical report on that. And, uh, but based on the, eventually, that based on the medical history, genetic and functional data, the child was the diagnosed as having an X-linked inhibitor of uh, uh, apoptosis deficiency. And uh, so they used, they kind of used this uh, uh, axon sequencing information, identified which variant is causing the disease. And based on these findings, core blood transplantation was performed to prevent development of life-threatening um, hemophagocytosis, or whatever it is, right? The patient received a, a yeah. I mean, those are not really human language. I, I would like to read more human language. The patient received a, a core blood transplantation, and, and after six. 42 days a post-transplant, the child was able to eat and drink, and there has been no recurrent of uh, this uh, uh, GI disease anymore, suggesting this mutation also drove the, the GI disease. All right, this uh, kid has been cured, all right, just because of it. And uh, seven months after doctors and scientists at the Medical uh, College of Wisconsin and the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin published a groundbreaking paper describing how they read the genetic the script of a young boy, and the largest hospital chain in the New England region is launching its own pilot program to sequence the genomes of selected patients. Okay. And uh, it, it's also reported there's uh, many people, many different people, and uh, bring in their 23andMe reports into the clinical practice and show to their doctors. I think that's a good opportunity for the genetic counselors and also the medical doctors to get more education on this subject. Because more and more people just bring in their genetic reports to the doctors. They have to use that information to have more meaningful clinical application. I think the pressure so far is really on. Okay. 
any question after that uh, personal genome sequencing. So the first one is a more on a clinical application, and the second one is a, a personal genome sequencing story help us to cure disease. I have to say, the doctor and this boy is really, really, really lucky, right? So we know that it's really hard to find the, the, the variants without any previous knowledge, just a, a, a disease-causing variants. And they found it. It's in the axon. It's in the immune disease. And more importantly, there is a treatment for that disease. So it's really, really lucky. However, this implication is very, very important. Yeah. So I think I, I'm just curious about a cost. Uh, you mentioned that it's a 17 cents per day. Right. So that translates to $170 per gigabit. Mm -hmm. And that's more than uh, enough to implement the uh, axon, which is 20, 26 uh, megabases or just uh, 40 Actually, actually, the, the, the axon sequencing cost right now is uh, the, the total cost, including the lab preparation and capture part, is about uh, two thousand dollars. It's very inexpensive, and uh, so you, what you are describing is uh, the sequencing cost. But when we get that sequencing, there's uh, many steps in front of it, which also costs a lot of money. So, so far, the, 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 the uh, axon sequencing cost is roughly $1,000 to $4,000, depends on the quality of the data and where, where you do it, and the scale of the, the, the order you can make, right? The larger the order is, the cheaper it is. Any other questions? All right. So, the last part of, I know everybody's tired, but we already had two breaks. So. <laughs> And uh, the different scopes of DNA sequencing and the whole genome sequencing, target sequencing, and pool sequencing. And this part will be very brief. Whole genome sequencing and the number of sequenced genomes grow fast with the cost of the sequencing jobs. So you can see there's uh, two curves here. This curve is uh, the sequencing cost, and this curve is the number of uh, genome has been sequenced. If you read it, I mean, it looks like a pretty striking, but this part is 15. So, so far, not many individual genome has been sequenced, okay? I'm not talking about a thousand genome sequencing project because those are not real personal genome sequencing. They have only full X coverage, so you are really don't have the confidence to identify the variants in the individuals. Uh, but uh, for the real whole genome sequencing, it's still less than 20. But this trend is going on and on. So. Uh, I think I, I, I read an a NCI report. They are saying by next year, there will be a, uh, maybe two years from now, there will be 1,000 tumor uh, patients, patients, tumor will be sequenced. And by the year of 2020, which is nine years from now, and um, uh, whole genome sequencing or part of the whole genome sequencing will be used into the routine. Uh, clinic practice in, ter in terms of uh, uh, cancer practice. I can get, get the, that figure next time, but it's very, very encouraging. So, uh, but so far, it's still cost prohibitive to study a disease. So not too much uh, has been sequenced. So in the research market, we cannot wait for the, job, the price to get dropped to that low. So at the current stage, there's still several different uh, uh, strategies that without doing the whole genome sequencing. The first one is uh, targeted sequencing. So what it means is uh, I cannot afford to sequence the entire genome. Rather, I will only sequence a portion of it, okay? And uh, axon sequencing is one of the, 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 the studies we already presented several times. And uh, that is one strategy to find out the regions you want to further sequence. And the other one is actually the linkage of GWAS derived regions. So we have a project that we found out in part of the genomic locations, it's more likely to associate with disease. You really want to design your target strategies for those regions and eventually uh, doing sequencing on that small proportion of the, the, the genome. Okay? And uh, the capture strategies and, uh, is uh, important. So you think of the sequencing now. I'm not focusing on the entire human genome, only a small portion of it. But how can I get that part of genome from the whole genome, right? And it's not a really easy task. And there's uh, several strategies to do that. The first one 
It's a long-range PCR, so you can do 5K, so sometimes even 10K amplicons, and it's not easy, but it's, a much, it's a very much doable. For smaller genes of regions of interest, that is still very important, and uh, samples can be barcoded. So uh, if you remember the put sequencing example I presented, and actually that is for smaller region of interest, it's only 145 kilobase, and then you can really do, they did a 900 long-range PCR to target that region down. So it's, a, it's not too, much, too bad if you have a very targeted region. And uh, another strategy which is not commonly used, uh, I would just list a reference here, and you, if you're interested, you can go to look at that. It's a reduced uh, representation library, it can be CDNA library, or you can use the uh, restriction enzymes. So I'm not going to talk into that. And, but two other uh, technologies to do the target is very important. The first one is uh, the so-called capture array technology. The second one is the capture in solution technology. Okay? For the capture array technology, and uh, this it was uh, based on the NimbleGen platform, so you can see this, uh, this is uh, the DNA, okay? And what I'm, I wanted, only part of the DNA, which is the purple part of the DNA. You can see there's a purple and black. Okay, it's a, okay, all right. I, I, I cannot see very clear from this. Uh, this direction. But there's some purple, there's some black in there. The point is only the purple part are the ones I want to, in, I want to sequence, further sequence. And the black part, and I'm not interested in. So what they did is uh, they will do the library preparation, put in linkers and those things. But more importantly, they will design the microarrays uh, to only target on the purple regions. And those purple regions are the region I'm interested in. I will design arrays to target it. So you can see that when you throw those here, and those purple ones will be hybridized to this array, while the black ones are kind of loose, right? Because there's, it's not being targeted. And then you further wash and do whatever you need to do, and then only the purple ones will be left, and then you further sequence the purple ones. So this is a capture array technology. There's many different platforms, actually. Nimblegen, Agilent, and uh, sometimes you can even get a spotted array to do that, okay? And, uh, but it's, uh, uh, there's another very interesting strategy it's called the capture in solution. So it's very much a similar idea of a capture array, but rather you, you don't put things on the array, you don't do the hybridization, rather you will design your probes or base and you get a, a belting labeled it. So you mix your samples with those, uh, those probes, and then the ones that uh, within the target region will have a belting, belting also attached to it eventually. Okay? And then you use these beads, and you can capture this, and then further do the sequencing. But it's a very similar strategy comparing to the capture array. So it's just not using array, rather you use about and so eventually you can pull those down. Okay? And uh, actually, in short select assay is the most important uh, uh, strategy for this, and, uh, and they can target 50 megabits of axon regions. This is a very much a standard practice right now. Okay? And, uh, but sometimes we feel capture is still too expensive. Okay, let's break the, down the cost, and this is related to Jake's question. Break down the cost a little bit. Target sequencing can still be expensive for hundreds of samples if you're doing that. And the cost associated to capture, including the design, the capture array, and baits, okay, and that is one time cost, right? You have to design it, design the arrays to target the region you're interested in. But the capture reactions is not cheap either. It's a couple of hundred bucks and for each sample. It's not really cheap. And there's a cost associated to the sequencing as well. Okay? For the real sequencing part, it's not too expensive, although it's a cost associated to that. However, you do the library preparation, it's very, very expensive. It's still a couple of hundred dollars per sample, even for the reagent cost. So adding up this together for each sample, the axon sequencing still costs us about a thousand to four thousand dollars, depends on the, the amount of work you are going to do. So for axon sequencing, each sample costs this much. It's too expensive 
if you want to study hundreds of individuals and, uh, and uh, for the family-based sequencing or selected. So the strategy is uh, you do the family-based sequencing or select extreme phenotypes. Okay? For the family-based sequencing, you don't have to sequence uh, really uh, 2,000 individuals. Rather, you, you sequence this, this family, uh, select the family members, because based on those categories, you will see whether it's a recessive or dominant disease. That can help you to, to rule out a lot of uh, variations that, that are not important. Okay? And you can sequence the, uh, the extreme the phenotypes. So you got the people very sick, not sick at all, and then you want to compare those. So that's some, some, some people using that as a strategy. And the pooled sequencing is uh, uh, become, uh, I think it's, a, it's the most cost effective and smart uh, ways of doing this. Especially when the cost to prepare the library for the sequencing is still very high. Okay? And, uh, I, and I don't see that job very dramatically in, in the near future. So the goal here is to identify genetic variants in the cohort of individuals. It's not going to be in, uh, I'm not going to see which variation is in which individual. Rather, I will only see the genetic variation in the cohort of individuals. Okay? So you can see that this is a general strategy. You've got different individuals, okay? and then each individual got their DNA samples. Okay? At this stage, you will mix their DNA. And then you will capture it, either use PCR or whatever strategy you want to use. And then you construct library, and then you do the sequencing. Okay? If we think of uh, uh, this capture part, for each individual one, it's quite expensive. And for the con library construction, it's a very expensive tool. And uh, we merge this back to one. That's really, really reduce the cost. Okay? So instead of you do each individual, do the capture, and do the construction of the libraries. So that is uh, the way that we're doing it. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the comments are just for the recording purpose. But the comments is uh, you can barcode the samples before you go through this kind of mixing DNAs. And hopefully in the, in the, in the later bioinformatics stage, you can uh, still decipher which DNA is that. And uh, yeah, um, it's, it's certainly possible. And that is uh, ideally the way to do it. But for those sequencer companies, they want to sell more reagent, and they really don't do that. But maybe some independent company can do it. Yeah. I don't see any reason that cannot be done, then, but uh, people don't just don't do that very often. And uh, they identify the variants, but won't know which variants are from which individual. And it cannot target too big of a region. If, uh, it usually has to be less than one megabase, uh, the total size. If it's lo longer than that, you will run into other troubles. And uh, analysis can be very tricky as well. And uh, it's, uh, it's not easy uh, to do. OK. Oh, I made it. So next lecture, and everything will be in the Center for Medical Genomics and for the people who registered the course. And uh, for the people who sit in, I'm sorry, can not go and because the classroom is very small. And we'll have a tour, and the second, uh, the location is the second floor of the VRTC building. And, uh, and the photo. so in the next three lectures, uh, th this is uh, today, and uh, the biological components of DNA sequencing. Next time, I'm going to talk about informatics and statistical components, and there will be more equations in that uh, lecture, and it will be less enjoyable comparing to this one. I'm sorry. And uh, including the map abilities, the refined alignment, uh, quality, recalibration, variant identification, and uh, structure variation, copy number variation, and those things. And uh, September 30th will be the application of bioinformatics components. And, uh, and we will have uh, the guest lecture from Tatiana Frode about an uh, example on the axon sequencing and how to build uh, um, family information into it. And also, uh, if I have time, I will talk about the prioritization for the genetic variants. All right? Everyone have a nice weekend. Oh, the registered students, please stay. Sorry. <laughs>